Our scientific institutions have been telling us that the Great Barrier Reef is doomed by a temperature increase of just 1.5 degrees. And even the temperature increase over the last century of just one degree has caused devastating impact on the Great Barrier Reef. But are corals so incredibly sensitive to such small changes in temperature? Will 1.5 degrees really kill 99% of the world's corals, as is often claimed, even those presently living in relatively cold water? Would the same species of coral growing on the southern Great Barrier Reef, where the water is cold, be as susceptible as a coral growing in the northern Great Barrier Reef, where it's much hotter? This claim that corals are all incredibly sensitive and near their upper thermal threshold is a remarkable for its audacity. What other creatures are so sensitive and so delicate? Why would corals evolve that way? They already live in environments where the temperature swings by easily 10 degrees in a year, and they can live in water for well over 35 degrees in the Persian Gulf to well below 20 degrees in other areas. Is it possible, in fact, that corals are amongst the creatures most tolerant to temperature changes? The latest statistics showing that the Great Barrier Reef is at record high coral cover despite having four supposedly devastating bleaching events in the last six years demonstrate serious questions of institutional reliability and integrity. Coral is a slow going species. It could not have had so many devastating coral killing events and now be at record high coral cover. What is certain though is that definitely on occasions quite a lot of coral gets killed by hot water. In previous videos we've also seen how coral is killed by cyclones or hurricanes and crown of thorns starfish. The reef is a dynamic system. It goes through periods of crash and regrowth. The reef is also bigger than most European countries. It shouldn't be surprising that on occasion some coral actually dies. It's actually kind of part of life. So let's take a look at bleaching. Now hard coral colonies range in size from a few centimetres up to many metres and they are composed of hundreds to literally millions of polyps. These are small animals, a millimetre across to maybe a couple of centimetres. And the polyp is an animal that makes a pot-shaped shell made of calcium carbonate that ultimately forms the coral. And this is very hard. It's almost as hard as concrete. Now, living inside the coral polyp is an algae called zooxanthellae. Now, these are light plants in the sense that they have chlorophyll inside them and they produce energy from the sun, which some of which is provided to the coral itself. The coral in return gives the zooxanthellae a nice, comfortable home. But occasionally this comfortable relationship seems to break down and we don't really know exactly why. And the coral ejects the zooxanthellae. It chucks them out. In this case, it is now bleached. And it's bleached because it goes white. And it goes white because it's the zooxanthellae that gives the coral its colour. When the, the zooxanthellae is chucked out, you can essentially just see the calcium carbonate skeleton, and that is white. Now, corals bleach from all sorts of stress, hot water, cold water, fresh water. Usually the corals are not killed when they're bleached. They are certainly not happy corals. They've lost their main energy source, but usually over a period of weeks to months, they regain the zooxanthellae, and sometimes they'll take in a different species of zooxanthellae. You mustn't equate bleaching with death. Now, the corals have this ability to choose the zooxanthellae that grows inside them. There can be disadvantages or advantages to a particular species. So if they take a high-octane zooxanthellae, which makes them grow really fast, that is likely to make them very susceptible to bleaching. That's a problem. On the other hand, they could take a low-octane zooxanthellae, which makes them insusceptible to bleaching, but that may, might make them grow very slowly, which is also a problem. So there are pros and cons, and which species is better will determine, be determined by what climate they're living in, and also what the weather is ultimately going to do sometime in the future. 
The point is that corals can choose, and this is an incredibly neat trick that they've got, they can adapt to temperature changes by simply changing the zooxanthellae that lives inside them. So most large organisms need to go through many generations of evolution and natural selection to ultimately change the DNA of the organism itself. And this could take centuries for a large organism to change, to adapt to changing temperatures. Corals can do it in a few months just by swapping the zooxanthellae. So rather than looking at bleaching as an unmitigated disaster, we should see it as a remarkable adaptive response mechanism, one which has clearly evolved over hundreds of millions of years that corals have been around. So yes, certainly sometimes large amounts of coral are killed by bleaching. Like many ecosystems, especially in Australia, such as forest with bushfires can cause devastation. But this sort of variability shouldn't be regarded as a recurring disaster. It's just part of life on the Great Barrier Reef. Why some corals die and others seem to pass through bleaching is not properly understood. But it is a, a adaptive mechanism. And the data on the Great Barrier Reef shows that the last four bleaching events, while certainly still killing some coral, especially in 2016 in the northern section, was barely a blip against the huge regenerative capacity of the reef. Cyclones and starfish kill far more coral, as could be seen by the low point which was reached in 2011 after major cyclones and crown of thorns starfish events. But bleaching attracts the headlines, and on a huge system like the reef, a reporter or a scientist inclined to report death and destruction can always find some dead coral. Not only are corals remarkable at adapting to temperature changes, they also grow much faster in hotter water. So for every one degree increase in temperature, they grow about 15% faster. That's why the most diverse, fastest growing corals on Earth live in the Indo-Pacific warm pool, the hottest, largest water body on Earth. Now you will often hear claims that mass bleaching events only started in the last few decades. So for example, an eminent coral reef ecologist from James Cook University stated on Australian Broadcasting Corporation Radio the following. A critical issue here is that these bleaching events are novel. When I was a PhD student 30 years ago, regional scale bleaching events were completely unheard of. They are human invention due to global warming. But records show that there were 26 bleaching events recorded before 1982. Bleaching was observed, in fact, on the first scientific expedition to the Great Barrier Reef from the Royal Society of London in 1929. And possibly the first observation altogether was this remarkable lithograph by von Ransenet in 1862, which was taken from a diving bell. There is absolutely no doubt that bleaching is not a new phenomenon. But what about mass bleaching? Have the major events where large amounts of coral die over large areas occurred before the 1990s? Now, given that bleaching tends to often occur in El Nino years, which affects scales of thousands of kilometers, if you get bleaching on one part of the reef, you're very likely to get bleaching within a few hundred kilometers away. Anyway, it must be remembered that before the 19 60s, there were almost no scientists on the Great Barrier Reef. In fact, in the 1930s, there was zero. By the 1960s, there was probably a couple of handfuls of scientists on the reef. Today, there would be easily thousands uh, with some interest on the Great Barrier Reef. It was not until the 1980s that large-scale study of the reef began and remarkable um, discoveries came. For example, mass coral spawning where Almost every coral on the reef releases eggs, forms slicks of eggs on the surface, which you can literally see from space. This was recorded first in the 1980s. Is it any wonder that we didn't know about mass coral bleaching, which is under the water and hidden, when we didn't even know about mass coral spawning, which is on the surface, in the 1980s? 
If a major bleaching event had occurred in 1925, who would have noticed? Who would have been measuring it and who would have cared? Technology such as scuba didn't even exist. It is a remarkable coincidence, isn't it, that mass coral bleaching only started when scientists arrived to study it. Now, in the year 1610, Galileo was the first scientist to make a telescope and point it at Jupiter, and he discovered moons which had never been seen. Finally, a scientist with the right technology arrived on the scene, and mankind knew about moons of Jupiter. The idea that coral bleaching is a new phenomena would be as crazy as Galileo's fellow colleagues arguing that the moons did not exist before 1610 just because nobody had measured them. So yes, maybe a warming climate is causing more frequent bleaching events. That would be a reasonable hypothesis, though there's not much evidence to suggest that's true. But to argue that they are a totally new phenomena that never occurred before is just an incredible claim. And scientists damage the reputation of science itself by making such claims. So in conclusion, coral bleaching has killed very little coral on the Great Barrier Reef, despite the media attention. And we now know after decades of research that bleaching is this remarkable adaptive response mechanism that actually allows corals to adapt to changing climates. They've seen this again and again over the last few hundred million years of their existence. Now, one could actually make a very strong argument that increasing temperatures should make corals grow even better. But at the very least, we should have considerable cause for optimism about the reefs in a warming climate. And there is no doubt whatsoever that there's been some despicable exaggeration about the negative influence of coral bleaching. Mm -hmm.